So the first one out is uh, Karin Meland, and uh, she's a medical doctor, yoga teacher, author, um, and graduate student of philosophy. So please give her a hand. Thank you very much. Now, my approach to yoga philosophy has been through my studies in India, through my own practice, and also through my studies here at the university where I, as was recently said, um, in the master program of philosophy. But what is yoga philosophy? I think most of you probably know yoga as a kind of sport or fitness practice, because in the West, yoga is most commonly promoted as a physical practice, sometimes also as meditation, while other kinds of practices and also yoga philosophy is far less known. But yoga as postures and uh, yoga as a physical practice is only a method of yoga, one method out of many. The methods are based on a philosophy that is meant to cultivate self-knowledge. This means that yoga is both a philosophy and a practice. Yoga has a long history. It can be traced back at least three to five thousand years. And there are different philosophical and practical teachings within this tradition. What we call classical yoga philosophy represents one of the six major orthodox schools of thoughts in Indian philosophy. The text Yoga Sutra is considered to be the foundational theory of this philosophical school. It was compiled by a man called Patanjali, probably around 200 CE. Classical yoga philosophy is a complete philosophical system and it teaches metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. Some of its ideas differ distinctly from the ideas in Western philosophy, while others are quite familiar to us. One example is, we are very familiar with the Cartesian model of dualism, which states that there are two foundations, or entities in reality, which are mind and body, or mind and matter. Yoga philosophy is also a dualistic philosophy, but it draws the metaphysical line differently. It draws the line between what it calls consciousness and nature. In Sanskrit, this is called purusha and prakriti. So on the one hand, you have the Consciousness of Purusha, which is formless, eternal, unchanging, and transcendent. And on the other hand, you have nature, or Prakriti, which has form, is non-eternal, changing, and perceptible. So, the dualistic model is familiar to us, but this specific idea is new to us, because as you can see from this model, you will classify both the body and the mind as nature in the same category. Because characteristic features of both mind and body are their changing or fluctuating state, uh, nature. But the aspect that I would say is the most unique to the yoga philosophy and maybe what distinguishes it the most from our Western philosophy is the basic understanding that it's practical. Yoga philosophy is meant to be practiced, to be experienced and lived. The methods of the practice are developed in order for the practitioner to experience the philosophical concepts through their own practice, and therefore to be able to acknowledge them as correct or true through their own experience. Yoga postures, meditation, breathing exercises, uh, mindfulness exercises, all these different methods in yoga are examples of this. 
These are exercises to implement the philosophy into life and for the practitioner to acknowledge through his or her own experience the same ideas that the theory describes. This is how I have experienced yoga as well. I spent three years in India studying yoga and during this time I learned and experienced yoga as a lifestyle. I learned the Sanskrit language in order to be able to read the philosophy. And I studied the philosophy in order to practice the methods of yoga. And the practice gave me an experience that again gained its meaning through my understanding of the philosophy. Yoga philosophy reflects this connection to life and practice. You learn the philosophy with intention to practice it and to experience its ideas. This includes the methods of postures, breathing techniques, meditation, and so on, but also the ethical principles like nonviolence. When it comes to the practice, an idea that lies at the heart of it is the aim of cultivating a clear, undisturbed experience of reality. As the mind is the means to experience reality, the idea is that if you can change your mind, you can change your experience of reality. And in the West, we may label this as psychology, but in yoga philosophy, this lies behind the understanding of the practice. An allegory or an example that is often used to describe this in yoga philosophy is the comparison of the mind to the water in a lake. Imagine your mind troubled with many thoughts and struggling to establish a focus. This is a lake where the water is disturbed. The surface will prevent a clear reflection and it's very hard for you to see in this reflection the image of the sky or the surroundings of the lake. And the disturbance on the surface will also prevent you from seeing into the water. But when the water is quiet, the reflection is clear and you can also see into the depth of the water of your own mind. And the idea is that insight into reality and into the structure of your own mind requires harmony and clarity of the mind. All the methods of the practice are designed to achieve this. Considering the metaphysics in yoga philosophy where body and mind are categorized, as we talked about, under the same category, not into two different categories, like the Cartesian model does, but in the same category, it makes sense to expect that the body can influence the mind and the mind can influence the body in exercises like yoga poses or meditation. I think it's interesting that this now also can be uh, confirmed by science. <laughs> yoga philosophy is meant to be studied and to be practiced. Therefore, philosophy and practice is closely connected and they are both essential parts to what we call yoga. Thank you. Thank you so much, oh. Karin. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. So, um, yeah, that was philosophy. Um, and now we're going to have a biologist take on yoga. So um, here is uh, Fari Sacholu. He's a professor at the Department of Biosciences. And uh, he recently came home from uh, a mantra meditation course in India. So I'm so happy he made it to uh, this event. Thank you very much, Sulvai, uh, for that introduction, and also taking this initiative. Uh, it's really a wonderful uh, event. Uh, I would also like to thank the um, library staff who uh, made this possible. Uh, I wish uh, my stay in India was uh, one month, but it was only 10 days. Uh, I was what's called uh, at an ashram. 
Ashram is like a hermitage uh, in India, and it means in Sanskrit uh, the place where all effort drops. You do not have any effort, it's so beautiful there. And I've been uh, practicing uh, yoga, meditation, breathing exercises for over 30 years, but this was, as it is each time, a very fresh feeling, because uh, as Karin gave us uh, an indication of it, uh, yoga is really very, very deep. There is really no end to it. Um, so as I started to practice uh, yoga and having seen its positive effects on me and the people around me, I uh, wondered, as a growing scientist, whether there is some science behind this. There has to be something uh, that is making yoga, yogic practice, uh, work in this fashion. So I'm going to share with you some thoughts and some observations uh, on that um, uh, that I have observed uh, during uh, this journey. So I would like to first start by uh, reminding us that we are not only the physical body or our emotions or mind, but we are a, um, a mixture of different spheres that make us up. So, of course, there is uh, the physical body. Um, we need an intellectual um, uh, a space where we are properly stimulated. You are in the right place at this wonderful university for that. Um, we need to have positive emotions, a supportive environment to uh, have that through our social interactions. Um, those of us who work already, maybe some of you, those students work at the site, occupational setup. And there is something about uh, a meaning in our life, a purpose in our life. So this is the wellness wheel. We are well and healthy only if this wellness wheel is properly supported. And what breaks this wellness wheel um, is chronic stress in our lives, which uh, we talk about it a lot, but we do not pay enough attention to it, I think, to do something about it. This actually is reflected even in the um, health organizations. Uh, I have given talks on uh, this kind of topics at the World Health Organization. Each time I go, I check uh, what is the entry about stress on their uh, list of uh, health conditions, and there is actually no entry, even though uh, it is estimated that perhaps 80% of the diseases are stress-related or affected by stress. Um, this is despite the fact that we know stress uh, modulates chronic stress. Of course, uh, we should emphasize that uh, stress in the short term, like when you are going to take an exam uh, next day or in a couple of days, then you have to uh, limit your... Uh, consumption of movies and this and that, um, and you have to really focus, and it's uh, very useful. Uh, it makes us more efficient. But chronic stress, through pathways that we understand, uh, um, really breaks down our system. It starts in the brain. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, we are hardwired to uh, respond to alarm conditions. This is from uh, our time, which was not too long ago, where we had to uh, be aware of wild animals and be able to escape from lions, uh, etc. So uh, the idea is that when th this comes, uh, we need to react, but then the system needs to turn off. But uh, in our Western-style living, this does not happen, turning off. So this is a summary slide. According to the latest research, the average human body is 20% water and 80% stress. Dehydrated. So we, yes, we have a lot of stress in our lives. And the field that studies the stress biology, we can say, is psychoneuroimmunology, which um, uh, posits that chronic stress, negative emotions, and individual characteristics, they feed 
onto the nervous system, endocrine system, and immune system, which are normally in um, very delicate balance and interacting with each other to keep our system going. Uh, however, if we have chronic stress, negative emotions, and negative individual characteristics, the system breaks down and disease arises. Um, how many of you feel when you are stressed for a period of time, you tend to catch colds much easier? Yes, most of us, isn't it? This is because psychoneuroimmunology. On the other hand, if you are able to handle stress and have positive emotions and individual characteristics, then uh, this supports these bi-directional interactions between the nervous system, endocrine system, and the immune system, and health and wellness arises. And this is our current understanding of science, but this is nothing new. In the ancient epic Mahabharata, part of the, you can say, yogic uh, literature or the support uh, knowledge, it says there are two classes of diseases, bodily and mental. Each arises from the other, and neither can exist without the other. Thus, mental disorders arise from physical ones, and likewise, physical disorders arise from mental ones. Thousands of years old. This is, in fact, at the basis of our modern uh, health tradition. Plato was a teacher uh, of um, the first physicians. He said the biggest mistake physicians make is attempting to cure the body without curing the mind. The mind and the body are one. And the very founder of our modern medicine, Hippocrates, he said, I would rather know the person who has the disease rather than the disease the person has. This is, in fact, another way of saying personalized medicine, which we have come to now, those of you who are uh, in this field. So um, we have to do something to um, deal with this chronic stress in our lives. And how to do that? There are many different ways. And of course, that would be to support the PNI axis and stress management skills, time management, diet, exercise, etc. I think based on the scientific research that's been done, Yoga, meditation, breath work, yogic practices are the best in this regard. I just checked uh, this morning in this uh, database of research uh, studies. There are more than 4,000 studies done on yoga as related to uh, health. And uh, it's a very uh, old system of health promotion, really. Yoga is not some physical exercise, as Karen was reminding uh, us. Uh, from my perspective, it is a system of health promotion. It is the first to recognize the impact of mind and emotions. They are linked to the body, and uh, for them to be pivotal, significant in restoration and uh, maintenance of vibrant health, which is uh, what we all want. And uh, the time is very short, so I will just summarize you some of the um, uh, positive effects of yogic practice. Uh, and those who are interested, we can talk about it uh, later on. There are really significant uh, studies showing that uh, yogic practice is very good, uh, effective in relieving depression, in relieving fatigue, anxiety, and anxiety disorders, which, uh, as you may all know, uh, they're on the rise uh, all around the world, including in Norway. Uh, chronic stress, post-traumatic stress disease, uh, hypertension, it, it improves pulmonary function. Uh, even in uh, chronic diseases, uh, life-threatening diseases like cancer, there are indications and research supporting that yogic practice is very useful. In fact, based on this, we have uh, just concluded a study on breast cancer patients here in Oslo at the cancer clinic. We are analyzing the results now, so we are really excited to find out what, what has happened. So if you come back to the wellness wheel, for every part of it, there is really some support that yogic practice has uh, a, a positive effect. So on the physical side, uh, there are distinct physiological effects. For example, this um, the stress hormone, cortisol, I'm sure most of you have heard, it gets normalized through yogic practice. There are very interesting changes in the uh, EEG pattern. 
I think Halvor may be uh, mentioning this uh, in the, uh, when he talks about meditation. Even the very structure of the brain changes in a good way through yogic practice. Blood pressure is reduced, etc. And then um, in terms of the mind and emotions, clarity of mind, better information processing, those of us who are students here, uh, not, a good thing, not, not a bad thing to have, uh, memory, uh, increased optimism, uh, etc. So for every part of this wheel, there is some uh, effect that's been uh, shown. And we also know something about the potential mechanisms uh, of how uh, these occur. I already mentioned uh, some hormonal alterations occur, such as in cortisol, um, EEG I mentioned there. Interesting changes are in the antioxidant oxidant enzyme levels which are protecting uh, our body from oxidants that we take in the food or in bad air and so forth. Um, uh, chronic inflammation is relieved. Uh, there are molecules which are secreted uh, from immune cells. There is an uh, uh, important uh, effect on those. And as a molecular biologist, I've been very interested in what ha may happen at the molecular level. And some studies indicated that there may be long-term effects on gene expression. So I'll finish with this part. Uh, several years ago, um, we asked the question, could there be very rapid short-term genetic effects? And uh, to get us all on the same uh, uh, page, I will give you a biology 101 <laughs> in the next one minute. <laughs> so this is a typical cell. If you, we have trillions of cells in our body, if you take one cell and cut it uh, uh, across, you will see something like this. It's a beautiful structure, um, really incredible, every little part. And like all of you know, somewhere in the middle, there's the nucleus, and in the nucleus is the genetic material. And our central understanding in molecular biology is that the information that is contained in the DNA that makes up our body, the uh, structure of it, but also the interactions between these parts. Um, this information is expressed through events that go through RNA and then protein. Uh, and this uh, process is called gene expression. Genes being those pockets of information uh, in our DNA. Um, so, then this begs the question, we have different cells in our body, uh, nerve cells, liver cells, heart muscle cells, lymphocytes. They have exactly the same DNA, uh, but uh, they have differences in the way they look and in the way they function. Why is that? That's because there are differences in gene expression patterns. Okay? Now, do you know this guy? Who's that? This is Roger Federer. Any tennis fans? He's playing in the US Open. He's 36. He was out for six months last year. He came back, won the Australian Open, won um, Wimbledon. Now uh, he just had a good match, so he's in the uh, fourth round. Now this is a chimpanzee. So how much different difference is there, you think, between Roger and this chimpanzee in terms of their DNA. Is it 1 to 2 percent? Is it 10 percent? Is it 20 percent? 50 percent? Most of you are undecided. <laughs> they look very different. They have a lot of hair. The, for those of you who don't know, the answer is 1 to 2 percent. So we are 99 or 98% identical with uh, a chimpanzee from uh, a genetic perspective. Now, do you know who this guy is? He's <laughs> Rafael Nadal. So he's another great champion. He's actually number one in the world now. He also had a, a leave uh, because of injury last year, and he came back. Uh, I think he was less than number 10, now he's number one again. Uh, he won the uh, French Open, um, uh, record 10th ten, ten time this year. And what is the difference between the DNA of Roger and Rafael Nadal? Now they have a lot of differences. Um, he's a lefty, he's a righty, 
He has a single-handed backhand. He has a double-handed backhand. They have a very different style if you watch them. So is it 10%? Is it 5%? Is it 1%? Is it 0.1%? Yes, most of you guessed right. It's 0.1%. So if you look at the person next to you, you are 99.9% .9 identical to that person at the level of the genetics. This is actually a, a, um, a reflection of uh, the great uh, yogic dictum uh, that uh, the world is my family. We are really a family. So the reason that we are so different uh, at the level of um, our body and so forth is, again, because of the changes in gene expression. So what we uh, hypothesize is that with the backdrop of these effects on uh, different bodily systems, yoga, yogic practice, may have also effects at the genetic, actually we should say epigenetic level, meaning the gene expression level. So uh, we've done this study on a comprehensive yogic practice, which includes uh, hatha yoga, uh, powerful breathing exercises, including sudarshan kriya. This is taught by a, a foundation called Arto Living. So we took uh, people um, who practice this once a week. There's what's called a long program. It takes two hours. So we took blood from them before and after this program, or the same people went for a nature walk, came back, listened to uh, relaxing music. We again took blood before and after, and then we compared um, the gene expression patterns in the immune cells. And uh, the technology is such that we can look at the differences in the gene expression for every single gene, which is approximately 20,000, uh, over 20,000, uh, in one go. So this is um, a microarray analysis or RNA sequencing for those of you who are in the field. So we've done a microarray analysis, and this is what we found. So this is the yogic program, and this is the uh, uh, control regimen. So I will not go through the uh, details of this. It's a uh, representation of the data. The columns are different uh, subjects. The uh, rows are different genes. You can see there is a significant difference where in this Venn diagram, you can see better, the yogic program gave rise to significant changes within two hours. Those of you who practice yoga, uh, you feel some difference between the time you go in to the session and out, which could be hour, hour and a half, two hours. So this is reflected, uh, at least for this program, and some other studies have been done since then. Uh, that there are distinct uh, gene expression changes. And uh, we have validated these results, and uh, we really have a uh, lot of information to follow up on. You can study when you have this kind of information, uh, the interactions between the different genes and the proteins they encode, etc. So, of course, there's a lot more to be done. Uh, and we are doing these uh, studies or planning to do uh, them at different levels. And uh, finally, uh, I think uh, these findings uh, overall show that yogic practices affect the psychoneuroimmunology system. So this is what you need to remember from a scientific perspective. The psychoneuroimmunology system is the one that we need to support uh, in our day-to-day -day life. And to be able to do that, yogic practices uh, are really uh, very effective from a scientific perspective. Of course, further studies need to be done, uh, additional subjects, longitudinal studies, and so forth. Uh, but uh, I think uh, those of you who may not be practicing yoga, you can do an experiment. You know, just go, start, take a few weeks, do it regularly, and see if it does something to you. I bet that it will, based on the science. So these are uh, the people who did the uh, molecular uh, studies in my group and at the Oslo University Hospital. And so this guy goes to the doctor and says, 
I'm learning how to relax, doctor, but I want to relax better and faster. I want to be at the cutting edge of relaxation. <laughs> All of us, very competitive. So if the doctor is properly uh, 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 learned and following the literature, he or she may say, then you should practice yogic breathing. <laughs> so I'll stop there. Uh, and if you have a few minutes uh, for, yeah? Okay, fine. I was going to show you a breathing exercise, but maybe later on we have an opportunity. So thank you for your attention. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. Uh, I think we should proceed with the breathing exercise. Yeah, we yeah. can do it. Uh, this breathing exercise is my favorite part of this show. <laughs> so, so why is that? <laughs> Okay, it'll be very fast. This breathing exercise. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> we'll do it efficiently. <laughs> Yoga helps us to, to be efficient, you know. So this is called Bastrika. Bastrika means bellows breath. Okay? And for this, uh, for the benefit of your uh, clothes and the person next to you, it's good to cleanse your nose first. So. Um, maybe we could uh, give out, for those who need, uh, some napkins. <laughs> so what we will do is, we'll have our hands, arms, loosely at our side, um, fists gently closed, and the back straight, okay? And we'll breathe in and out through the nose. So, as we breathe in, we'll throw the hands up and open the hands like two suns in the air, really open. And then as we breathe out, we'll close the fists and breathe out forcefully, okay? Like this. Very good. Continue. Close your eyes. If you're out of rhythm, you feel, just gently open one eye, get into rhythm, close it again. And relax, hands in the lap, palms facing up. Relax. Normal breath. Arms in position for a second round. Loose fists, arms loose. We'll first take a normal deep breath in and out. And out. And And relax, hands in the lap, palms facing up. Final round, arms in position. This time with a big smile, fake or not, doesn't matter, just smile. Normal deep breath in and out. And
and relax, hands in the lap, palms facing up. Slowly, gently, you may open the eyes. Mm. Good? Vastrika, what did you feel like? Different? Lighter and fresher. Anybody else? Better circulation. Yeah. Grounding, Grounding, calming, focused, focused. happiness. Happiness. (laughs) Great. See, we just changed the way we breathe just for a couple of minutes. Really has a strong effect. So I invite you to uh, explore these practices. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fede. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, it's a good time to take a very short break. It was planned to be five minutes, but I think we will take maybe three. <laughs> it's okay with five? Okay, five minutes just to stretch our legs and calibrate for the next session. Okay. Okay, everybody. We have to start up again with the next two presenters. And uh, after the other two presentations, we are going to make the panel talk to each other. Um, so the next speaker is Halvor Eifring, uh, and he's a professor of Chinese, but he also happens to be the head of Akem Norway, and a meditation teacher, and etc. Okay, so um, uh, I was looking around in university to find people who had something to do with yoga, and I was actually overwhelmed that so many from different fields um, have research related to it. Um, so um, just before we start this next session, I would like to just do a quick count up. Um, how many of you have done yoga before? Okay, so that's the majority. Um, how many of you are students? Oh, okay, good, okay, so let's start. Thank you. Okay, so we will talk about yoga. And when we think about yoga, as uh, both, I think, Karin and, and uh, Fari have already said, we easily think about some bo- body practice. Uh, you can all do this, can't you? I'm sure you can. <laughs> you just have to train a little bit. Uh, so, and this is not just something that is uh, ridiculous, it's something that is being practiced in this way uh, uh, and has a very strong bodily focus. Um, you also have different forms of gymnastic yoga in all the kind of training centers, fitness centers uh, in Oslo and everywhere, everywhere else in the world, uh, which also has a very strong uh, focus on the body uh, and what you do with your body, which is, of course, an important part of yoga, but it's not the only part. So uh, what I will try to say something about now is the mental aspect of yoga, uh, the uh, aspect of yoga that is more meditative, uh, which is, of course, something that has been around all the time. Uh, Probably even before we had yoga in the form we know it today, the word yoga was much more of a mental discipline than a physical bodily discipline. Uh, some, of the, some of my colleagues in England and uh, America have done research on the development of Hatha Yoga and found that it was actually very much a product of uh, Swedish and English gymnastics coming together with some uh, yoga background and then up came some kind of modern Hatha Yoga. I don't think that's the whole story. There are many more stories to talk about than that. The main story I want to talk about, though, 
is the fact that yoga is about much more than the body. The body is a part of a whole where uh, the main focus, in a way, is on the mental, you might say spiritual, uh, and that's uh, the essence of what I would say is then the meditative yoga, uh, whether it is like here in the Akim School of Yoga, or in Norsk Yoga School, uh, where much of my uh, knowledge of yoga comes from, um, or it's in other schools of yoga with varying degrees and various, uh, varying mm, ways of focusing on the meditative aspect of yoga. Um, when we talk about the meditative aspect of yoga, one thing that is very central, and you can see that all throughout the history, is the phenomenon of mind wandering. When you sit here, you may try to listen to what I and others are saying, but at the same time, there will be thoughts coming and going, and uh, you will think about, oh, what, what do I have to buy for dinner today? You will be thinking about many other things, or uh, we can actually do it right now. Just close your eyes. Close your eyes. And just observe where your mind is going. Maybe you're thinking about things that have just happened, that are going to happen. Maybe you have feelings, cold or warm, tired or awake. sensations in your body. Fantasies and imagery. Just follow what is there. slowly open your eyes. Okay, so that was the whole inner mental context in which yoga takes place, in which meditation takes place. So for everybody who wants to do yoga or wants to do meditation, you have to somehow relate to the fact that thoughts come and go. They take you away from what we call the here and now, but they're also part of the here and now. So mind wandering is an essential fact and different meditative, contemplative or yogic traditions throughout the centuries or millennia have related to this phenomenon in different ways. Some like some Christian and some Buddhist traditions have looked upon some of these thoughts that come to you while you're trying to do your meditation or your prayer or whatever as temptations from the devil. Others have looked upon them as something that is external, a kind of disruption of your activity, while yet others have said that, well, they're part of you and they may even be beneficial for you. So there are different ways of relating to this aspect of uh, your mind during yogic or meditation or meditative practice. So meditative yoga also has to relate to this part. It says in the uh, probably the most famous sentence in the Yoga Sutra, the second sentence there, uh, roughly translatable as yoga brings the fluctuations of the mind to silence or to halt. And um, so, in a way, it sounds like some of all this mind-wandering is going to calm down through yoga. And that may be part of it. So, okay, let's just take that as a basis. That, okay, doing yoga is supposed to calm down these fluctuations of the mind, all these things that come and go. 
in the mind, then you can think of two ways of doing that. You can think of it as something you have to go for a state of mind where all these things are shoved aside or suppressed. That's the directive way of doing it. There are many ways of, or many meditative methods that do it this way by suppressing the thoughts. Or you can do other things. You can have a more non-directive approach, which then lets the thoughts pass freely. And uh, it may have to walk a little further, but then also passes through a larger area of your mind. And maybe, rather than suppressing the thoughts, is able to uh, work your way through some of the thoughts. Uh, I will talk mostly about the second way here, but both are ways to make your mind calm down in yoga, in meditation, and in meditative yoga. So, in order for your yoga, and I'm talking about physical yoga, to be most, I mean, as beneficial to meditation as possible, what, how should you do yoga? And what I'm going to say now, I mean, some of the things I have said are based on some of the cultural research that I've done. Most of what I'm going to say now uh, is based on the book that I just showed you, the one on meditative yoga, uh, which is my main source. So if you do meditative yoga, how will you do your movements? May not be so diff different from what most of us do when we do yoga, whatever kind of yoga we do. Slow pace. Well, there are types of yoga and uh, yoga exercises that have a fast pace, but basically I think we all agree that the most typical yoga is the one with slow pace. Half-closed or closed eyes, which of course then lets you sort of stay a little bit away from uh, the uh, uh, surroundings. And if you use an EEG electroencephalogram, uh, uh, machine uh, to s look at your brainwave pattern, it will notice, even if you don't, that your brainwave patterns changes when you close your eyes and rest, and even more so when you meditate. Okay, and then one important thing, stretch gently and hold. Stretch gently, yes, of course. No, that's not a matter of course. Many of us, like me, I want to do this yoga posture. And then I come back here and, oh, it's so embarrassing in front of everybody and I can only come down here. So I'll try a little extra, right? And even if you weren't here, you would be in my mind and I would still sort of try to achieve something. And that brings the muscle into, muscles into a very different kind of, very different kind of activity than just sort of the mild, gentle stretch. And then something that we all have to learn, only use the necessary muscles. If we turn around, most of us will not just turn around, we will, uh, 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 we will move lots of muscles that we don't need to, to turn around. So gradually learning to let go of the muscles that you don't need is also part of the kind of relaxation that is beneficial for the meditative part. And the breath, breathe through the nose, we already heard, and coordinate your breath and the movements. What about the attention? That's an important part. Let's say, like her, she's a little blurred, but uh, if she's going to turn around like this. The first instruction she'll get is probably to have her eyes open and just follow the hand as it moves backwards. As she gets more into the, into the uh, practice, she may close the eyes, and follow the movement with her attention without looking at it, but you can still feel the movement. She can f follow her breath as it is part of this movement. And ultimately, 
what she can do is to do the movement and of course breathe with the movement and have a more sort of holistic awareness where she where the movement the breath and she herself is part of a larger sort of attentional focus which is a very open focus where you just sort of the room is also part of her so that kind of gradual opening up of the attention is an important part and then i promised you the thoughts the mind wandering how do we relate to that okay while you hold a pose in yoga there is many things you can do one possibility which is in this case beneficial is to have a more sort of open uh, unfocused awareness where you don't concentrate on what you're doing you're just there and if thoughts come and go they're also there and you let go of everything after each pose uh, so that after each pose your body and your mind is able to sort of restore itself which means also letting thoughts come and go and then after a long sequence of yoga uh, yoga poses or practices or exercises you lie down for the corpse pose which many people say is the from a meditative point of view is the most important yoga pose lying down like these people do it's a quite comfortable pose also and then end the whole thing with a non-directive meditation after a whole yoga sequence and uh, i would prefer to do this but that would take a little long to teach anybody here mm -hmm. then you would have to go to a course there are courses but uh, we can't do that now so what we will do is to take one of the uh, exercises that's from also from this yoga book meditative yoga and we'll do it together here so find a comfortable way of sitting if you have a chair you can have good support to your lower back if you don't have a chair try to find a comfortable way of sitting don't be too particular about how beautiful you should look just make it comfortable for yourself and place your hands in a lap palms up close your eyes and first just turn your attention to your mouth relax your mouth your tongue your throat your jaws and then turn your attention to the breath going into your body and out again don't tr try to change your breath it may change by itself but you're not supposed to change it you just you're just aware of it into your body and out again
you may experience that other things come into your attention as well. Thoughts, feelings, sensations, fantasies. Don't try to push them away. Though when you discover that they're, they've taken over, you just go back to the attention on the breath again. And now turn your attention to your nostrils and feel the breath going in through your nostrils and out again. And also hear how your breath, the sound of your breath, going into your nostrils and out again, how that sounds, however small a sound. Some of your thoughts may carry you away, that's fine. When you discover, you just go easily and gently to back to the breath and your nostrils. slowly open your eyes and I think I was lucky now because I was closing my eyes all the time when she was said to tell trying to tell me that time is up <laughs> was it okay to do was it difficult not difficult thank you Thank you so much, uh, Halvar Efring. A uh, little attention for you. Thank, Thank you me. so much. Okay, so I think now uh, our minds have been very calm and very calibrated and ready and receptive to the coming presentation. Uh, and we're going to listen to Katinka Freista. And she's a social anthropologist and she's a professor of modern South Asian studies. So give her a hand. Thank you very much. Um, I actually have to have a manuscript because otherwise my mind starts to wander. And um, I'm going to go into uh, a little more depth uh, in some of the topics that was raised by uh, Halvor Eifring here. Um, now, how many of you have been parts of yoga classes like this? Not necessarily as big, but still, right? Quite a few of you, very good. Okay, and now in these uh, yoga classes, what we very often hear, and I'm sure that many of you have heard this, what we hear is that yoga is an old tradition which has very, very deep roots. Uh, the roots are in India, and it might even be a tradition that is as old as 5,000 years. Uh, and then what very often happens is that the yoga teacher will justify that claim, which is not untrue, by referring to 
archaeological findings that predate the Indic scriptures that uh, suggests that uh, yoga is a very, very ancient uh, practice. And this is, of course, not untrue. Uh, this, this is quite true. But what we still need to think a bit more about is what has happened to the globalization of yoga during the past, uh, especially the past 100 years, because I think the story of yoga and globalization is much more interesting than uh, what we can hear in, in this master narrative, which is often presented in this, uh, these, class, these kinds of classes. Um, so I want to just give you a few examples of that. And uh, one of them is, of course, the example of Ashtanga yoga, which I know that many of you practice and are very fond of, and I've also practiced it myself, and I'm very fond of it myself. Now, as Eifring just said, um, there was a lot of modern innovation in yogic practices in um, the mid-20th century. Uh, and as far as Ashtanga Yoga was concerned, what we know is that it was more or less invented in the 1930s by, uh, okay, I don't have to say this, by this person who is uh, Tirumalai Krishnamacharya, who lived as long as until 1989, and it was further elaborated by his famous pupils, Patabi Joyce, who many of you know, and BKS Iyengar. Uh, why did this happen in the 1930s in particular? Why was this such an innovative period in the history of India and the history of yoga? What happened was this. India, as you know, had been colonized by the British for 60 years, and the independent movement, independence movements, I mean the, the, the movement to get rid of India, to get rid of the colonizer, was getting stronger day by day. Now, in the south Indian city of Mysore, the king, Maharaja Krishnaraja, Vodiyar IV, he was deeply worried about his own country, which he referred to as a civilization that has lost its way. So to help India regain strength, while finding back to its roots, he installed a gym in his royal palace. The gym was primarily for the sons of the royal family, and to run it, he appointed Krishnamacharya, the guy here, um, who was uh, very well fit, and who also had an additional qualification. He had studied yogic philosophy, which was uh, presented by mm, um, er earlier this day, um, by uh, the yogic philosophy of Patanjali for 10 years or so in the foothills of the Himalaya mountains in, in the Tibetan region. And so he, after that, he had traveled around in India for around five years uh, to pass on uh, what he had learned in this period. But then the king, he was more keen to have his princes learn physical uh, exercises of various kinds. So in the gym, that was what they focused on. Where they actually had a double teaching. They had yoga classes and they had uh, classes in, in gymnastics. So what Krishnamacharya did was to eventually start to merge these two. Uh, and it happened very slowly and very gradually. And he took inspiration then from a lot of the gymnastic practices that uh, were around in India at the time, uh, which was a uh, practice at the YWC, uh, YMCA, and which was practiced actually in Indian schools where they also had physical education. And uh, one of the uh, most prominent schools of gymnast gymnastics that they had that day was uh, actually not Swedish, but it was a Danish manual of training uh, written by one uh, Nils Buch, uh, who was quite famous, and he also ran a lot of schools in Denmark. So, so that became a very thorough inspiration for Krishnamacharya in his teaching, and later on he also incorporated that in his yoga classes. We can see that quite clearly, that similarity in the Surya Namaskar classes, which originally was taught in his gymnastic classes, but that later was incorporated into the, um, into the, the yoga classes. Now, what Krishnamacharya said at the time, and many of you know this story too, was that uh, he had found the entire sequence of Surya Namaskar and of uh, the rest of the what later became the Ashtanga Yoga in a scripture named Yoga Kurunta, which he had come across in a library in Calcutta. 
And he also claimed that shortly afterwards this scripture was eaten up by ants so that nobody would be able, was able later to verify that claim. Now, it's quite interesting that he said that, and we shouldn't really dismiss that as any attempt at forgery or so. I think it was a very heavy pressure on him to popularize yoga at the time and to try you know, to do that by enhancing the authority of the yoga tradition that he actually more or less uh, founded. So all in all, this history of Ashtanga Yoga is an example of a modern invention, uh, but also of a modern invention that conceals its, modern, uh, its modernity and that conceals its foreign impulses. And if you wonder where I have this from, it's from this book, uh, which is called The Yoga Body and which was written by Mark Singleton. And if somebody wants to read more, there's also a, an interesting uh, PhD thesis written at the University of Trondheim, NTNU, written by Lars Jürgen. Can you stand up? Uh, in social anthropology, which uh, is based on fieldwork from, from this tradition, and it also recounts the story in more detail. Now, you could always argue that Ashtanga Yoga is a special case. So, let us move over to another one, that of Swami Sivananda, and the organization that he formed, which is called the Divine Life Society. Some of you might have been in touch with that as well. Now, this is uh, Sivananda. Now, at approximately the same time that Krishnamacharya fused ancient Indic yogic exercises with modern gymnastics, another yogic tradition began to develop in the northern part of India. Like Krishnamacharya, Sivananda here, uh, was a South Indian Brahmin from uh, the highest segment of the Indian society then, and he was educated as a medical doctor uh, he, as many others uh, in his position, took the opportunities that were offered by being parts of the British Empire. So he travelled to Malaya, uh, currently Malaysia, to work at a hospital there. But as the years passed, he became increasingly dissatisfied with his life abroad and began to take an interest in Hindu philosophy and whatever he could learn about Hindu philosophy while being away in Malaya. Um, which was evidently not enough for him. So in 1920, or shortly afterwards, he returned to India and bought a train ticket from there to uh, the North Indian pilgrim town of Haridwar, which is a central uh, Hindu pilgrim town. And from Haridwar, he walked by foot up towards Rishikesh, where he became a monk. And from there, he sent letters to relatives and friends about how one can live a divine life in the Himalayan foothills. And by that, he suddenly became one of the few mystics in that area who was able to transmit his knowledge in English to a much larger audience than before. So in this way, people started to flock towards him. Uh, one of those who did so was the famous scholars of uh, religious mysticism, Mircea Eliad, whom some of you might have known about. Uh, and then the disciples kept flocking to him and he needed uh, some accommodation for them. So in 1936, he founded an ashram, a, religi a religious center, where his disciples could stay. And one of the cornerstones of his teaching in this period became a particular sequence of uh, uh, postures, physical postures, that became known as the Rishikesh series. Actually, it was became, became even more famous in Germany because he had a German disciple who went back to Germany and founded the Divine Life Society there. So the series is even more famously known as the Rishikesh Reihe. Um, so we don't really know how that came into being, but what we do know is that the teachings of Swami Sivananda was continuously refined and elaborated as his foreign disciples came to him, went back to their home countries and you know, started their new centers. Um, what we also know is that in this process, new pamphlets were written, new books were written, new modes of explanation were introduced, new modes of justification added, such as the presentation of yoga as an ecological practice and so on. And what we also know is that followers keep circulating between these various uh, centers which are differently placed across the world and that the movement keeps evolving, keeps reinventing itself, keeps adapting to new situations in new societies, to uh, followers who might have different needs. So the model 
that grows out from the case study of the Sivananda uh, type of yoga is that uh, uh, yoga is not really you know, a, a movement that's been disseminated from India and to the West, and that's it. But it's been produced as a continuous exchange between disciples which are who are differently placed. And uh, it's also shown that these centers that are placed in Switzerland, Germany, the USA, in India and elsewhere, serves as they serve as oasis for people. People go there to spend a week or so and they come back, feel rejuvenated and they, ha they have learned something new deep in their own practice. So the oasis regime is, is, is uh, a very significant trait of this particular movement and maybe also of many other similar movements. So what the mm, scholars that have been working on this particular yoga tradition uh, draws our attention to is the way in which yoga is, you know, it, it's come about as a transnational production. And that's the model of globalization that is, uh, that is most salient in this case. And the book that I'm drawing on is this one, Sarah Stroh's Position in Yoga, uh, Balancing Acts Across Cultures. And I know I have limited time now, but I want to just um, mention one final case, uh, which can tell us about uh, how yoga has become disseminated in ways that d does not necessarily show a clear dissemination from India and out. Now, one of the yogis that was sent to disseminate Indic yogic traditions to the West was Paramhansa Yogananda, whom some of you have heard about. And he, this is the guy in the framed photo uh, at the lower uh, left there. Now, in 1920, he arrived in Boston and there he founded an organization called the Self-Realization Fellowship, which is now headquartered in Los Angeles. It's still active. Now, his line of yoga is called Kriya Yoga, and that was not the gymnastic kind, but it was a much more meditational form of yoga. But his reinvention in the transition from India to, U to USA was quite evident. What he did was to, for instance, he had to advise his followers to sit in chairs rather than to sit cross-legged, which was difficult for a lot of Americans. He simplified the meditational techniques, he uh, disseminated his teaching in courses rather than in a uh, one-to-one guru-disciple relationship. He even initiated correspondence courses for people who were not able to come to him in, in uh, Los Angeles or Encinitas, where he also stayed. And then the interesting part is that in 2003, 15 years ago, Kriya Yoga meditation began to find its way back to India in its Americanized form. And that happened because the, the, the gentleman sitting here, Swami Kiryananda, which was, who was one of the disciples of Paramahansa Yogananda, decided to bring back the meditational practice of Kriya Yoga to India. So he went there with an entourage of uh, 10 of his disciples again. And there again, uh, a new transition started to form. Uh, what happened now was that they discovered pretty soon that in order to uh, make especially young Indians, middle-class Indians, interested in, in meditation, uh, it wasn't enough to say that it was uh, an old Indian tradition. It wasn't even enough to say that it was from Yogananda. It was certainly not enough to say that it was uh, about you know, a, a way of uh, experiencing the inner uh, divine. What they had to say was that it was a technique uh, that would help people alleviate stress and a technique that could uh, enhance your concentration so that you can get richer faster. Uh, and by you know, marketing their movements in that way, then it became, uh, it became quite, uh, quite popular. So we see in that case a double, not just a, yeah, a return globalization, you know, India to the US and back, which um, carries with it a, a double adaption. So the return globalization did not reverse the Americanization, but it sort of doubled it by Indianizing the American version of, of Kriya Yoga, which is why uh, different Kriya Yoga centers uh, all over the world will actually have quite different teaching, which I think is interesting. And now I'll just conclude, okay? I know I'm <laughs> running late. So what's interesting is that nothing ever stands still, and we shouldn't pretend that it does. And yet, a lot of people want to close their ears to these uh, transmutations that happened uh, across places and across generations. Sometimes people even get angry. And why is that? Well, uh, okay, that's the book that I drew that from. 
Um, a lot of people want the background, the foreign influences, and why is that? Well, in the Indian side, uh, it's a long and complex story. Uh, but I think they became quite um, aghast at the fact that foreigners, and especially Americans, were cultivating the practice of yoga so much more intensively than Indians themselves were doing, you know? Uh, and another thing was that um, uh, an Indian-American yoga teacher named Bikram Yoga, uh, Bikram Chaudhary, tried to patentize uh, various yogic practices who had been taught for a long time, but he wanted to claim them as his own. Now, the Indians, and th even the Indian government got angry, and they said, look, no, 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 we can't have that. So they started lobbying very hard in order to reclaim yoga, to teach the world that this is Indian, and it's not foreign, it's Indian, and in order to make everybody here, they campaigned very hard uh, towards the United Nations to make the United Nations uh, install or devote a particular day to yoga, which is now, since 2014, the International Yoga Day. Huh? And there you can see India's Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, sitting in front of a lot of Indian college students in uh, the heart of New Delhi uh, to show the world that this is our gift to the world. This is a form of soft power, right? <laughs> okay. Now, Westerners also sometimes get angry when they hear about these inventions, and that puzzles me a lot. But um, uh, that has actually very different roots. What happens in the West is that we have a very strong sense that whatever comes from something very far ago, where very far away and very long ago must be true. You know, if something is 5,000 years old and found in the mountains of Tibet, <gasps> it's automatically true. And I think the same is happening a little bit uh, with, with yoga, which is why we want it to be old, we want it to be Indian. But it's not only that. The story is much more complex and interesting. And I think we should appreciate all the inventions and all the good things that these each of these persons in each lineage have done in order to make yoga and meditation in all kinds, adaptable to new situations and new places. Yes? yes. Thank you. <laughs> ah. Okay, so thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And we will see maybe if we can have a turn from looking at yoga as something very old and true to maybe something very uh, much in the now and scientific. Mm -hmm. and yeah, so we will see after the break what happens when these very different scholars talk to each other. Um, we have very little time, so mm. it's seven minutes sharp, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That was a short break, but I hope you found some nice people to talk to and that you are ready now for the next part, um, which is the most exciting part because we have now all the scholars and also John, who is a very experienced yoga teacher. Um, and uh, he's the founder of Eight Treasures Yoga. And yeah. Um, and later on, he's also going to lead a yoga session with live music. But first, we're going to speak. And after we talk a little bit, then we will also open for questions from you guys. Okay, ready? Um, so I would like to ask you first many of you have your own yoga practice. So would you like to tell us a little bit about it? Like, do you do it regularly? And what kind of, like, what's the nature of your practice? <laughs> yes? <laughs> uh, I do uh, yoga now every day. Uh, and ideally, I do it right before I meditate, so which I also do every day. So. Uh, Mm, I sh should, I guess, do it longer than I do every day, but I do at least sort of uh, at least twenty minutes or so, so every day before I do my half hour of meditation. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yes. I wish I did it every day. I don't. Uh, I used to for a long time. Uh, I now depend much more on those oasis regimes. You know, doing one full week every year where I go and that's all I do that week. And uh, that makes my life hang together. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I feel like I'm uh, attempting to practice every day. And uh, I guess it depends on how we define our practice. I define my practice as uh, one of the definitions of yoga is to join or to bring together. And I can think of this as also integration. So sometimes I think of different parts of myself that maybe I would like to believe are not part of me. Mm. Oh, I caught myself being angry or sad or <laughs> some other unacceptable way of being. So for me, the yoga practice is very much about just being able to be present to who I am and what is going on with me at every moment. And I see that as a potential to have a moment-by-moment -moment yoga practice that doesn't necessarily involve our mat or sitting in any particular way. But all those things are supportive to being able to be present to our moment-to-moment -moment existence. Yeah. Mm. Yes, and uh, I'd like to ask, um, yeah, um, some, some yoga classes tend to be almost like ritual feeling. And I was wondering, what do you think that makes for people? How, how, what does it do to like Norwegians to partake in uh, a ritualistic experience? And is it most about connecting to yourself, or is there also a, a group aspect? And uh, yeah. If no one else, I just. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ritual is great. I mean, they've. Uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one is just, I mean, you, you'd spoken about this idea of why are we attracted to something that has this air of tradition or it has all this weight of history behind it, and then we're disappointed when we find out it's rather recent. We shouldn't be. Yeah, we shouldn't be. I mean, but there is also something comforting in the thought that maybe someone has tried this before and it has worked. I think it's very comforting. So that's one thing that can be comforting about ritual. But also something about ritual that when we're familiar with a practice, when it becomes second nature, we can drop out of this, um, this analytical mind. And it, it's like driving a car. If you're driving a car and you stop thinking about it, and then you're like, oh my gosh, I, gosh, I should have been paying attention. <laughs> so if, if we're in that state in our yoga practice, then we're not in a crisis state. And I think it's such a relief in this life that we're living to be able to downshift where we just, we know what's coming next. We're doing the ritual. It's very comforting. And then that can allow us to drop deeply into an awareness of ourselves. It can allow us to breathe. It can allow us to drop out of this stress state where we maybe have to be hypervigilant. So that, that I think is one of the benefits of ritual. I may comment uh, on that. So uh, I also think that ritual is act actually something very comforting, as long as it's not uh, connected to religion, because there is a um, resistance towards religion, maybe for some good reason. Uh, but ritual, uh, what I find uh, is that people really open up once they let go, because uh, there's a lot of beauty in, in rituals, and also comfort, and then as you're expressing something that you can just let go and be with it. Mm. Is it so I don't see. Sorry. So I don't see it uh, being so contradictory uh, to our Norwegian way of mm. looking things, mm. uh, at things, as long as we just take that step and let go. That we are really doing an experiment, and we've decided, and we take that step, and then let mm. go. And is it necessary to, do you need to achieve this feeling of ritual and do you need that to connect to, to like pure consciousness? Do you need that or is it okay to just do, you know, the, um, the physical, the exercising and as long as you conduct it um, at the same time as you breathe and is that, like is there some essence of yoga that makes one thing yoga and another yoga not yoga? To, if I may comment on that. Uh, yeah. These are practices, you know, as a scientist, we, mm -hmm. we should be able to study them and uh, to be able to do that, they need to be reproducible. And for that, they need to uh, be similar experience for different people. And so, uh, like the practices uh, I presented research on, 
these are very one, two, three uh, kind of things. So a ritual uh, feeling or being in a ritual feeling or some uh, connection in that way or some belief is not necessary. Right. The experience comes. Mm. So it's just very straightforward practice. Yeah. So you don't need to feel like the universe if in order for something to happen in your genes? No. Okay. So good to know. <laughs> But yeah. I, think, I think one thing that can be mentioned also when I, when I talk about rituals, I mean, when in yoga, it's in every practice of yoga, you have this aspect of repetition, which is also a kind of, you know, the ritualistic about it. The yeah. thing that you do the same thing every day, or, I mean, when you choose a practice, either you do the same like postures or the same meditation practice, the breathing practice. So one thing is the repetition in itself, but it's also this idea that every time you repeat it, you sort of dig deeper into your own sort of being, like your mind or your body or mm. your consciousness. Of it's something that becomes familiar to you. Yeah. And that also makes it easier than to sort of drop into this mm. awareness uh, yeah. of the practice. Mm. Uh, right, okay, yeah. yes. Can I just add to that? Um, I've attended a number of different uh, yoga meditation classes over the years here and in India and elsewhere. And I think the explanation that fits my experience best is uh, the explanation that what happens when you do this, whatever you do, wherever it is, it centers you and it peels off. It peels off all your outer layer of consciousness, all your outer layer of mm. being, your thought that I'm a mother, a professor, a this, a that. Mm. And it strips all that away and you're left with something that is not even an I-ness, maybe. Uh, a sense of me being me. Uh, in, in the Vedas, there is this uh, famous exercise of aham brahm. I, you know, you, you, what, am I this? No. Am I this? No. Am I this? No. Am I this? No. Trying to find out the core where you discover that it's just like an onion. There's actually no core. It's just divinity. Mm. Um, so there, it goes right back into that yogic philosophy, even though you don't even have to talk about it. Right. So it sounds maybe useful for people in this, like the age of social media and, you know, a lot of sensory input all the time, a lot of impulses and... Um, some something useful, you know, to connect back to this state of consciousness, maybe. Yeah, what do you think, Halvar? Uh, yeah, I think, and uh, whether you talk of rituals or of philosophy, uh, they are, of course, always tied up in the cultural setting, uh, which is where they sort of have their meaning. And I think the in those cultural settings, they definitely have a very important function. Yeah. Uh, but I th also think, much like uh, Fari says about uh, when he does his experiments uh, or studies, that some of the things in yoga are also effective outside of those contexts. Yeah. So that, and I think for a uh, Norwegian setting or uh, any other setting, that it's also important to have access to places where you can learn yoga, where you can learn meditation without having to go into, without having to use incense or without having to do or go through specific rituals and without having to adhere to one specific uh, Indian or other philosophy. Mm. So, so that you, you can sort of get to know how is it actually working, mm. not only in the body, also in the mind, mm. but, uh, but in a setting that where you're more sort of focused on your own process mm. rather than on trying to be somewhere else. Right, <laughs> yeah. Mm. One thing I, I may add, ritual is also something that you do regularly. So from that perspective, ritual is very useful in the practice. Uh, uh, because uh, if you do something, it's like brushing your teeth, right? Uh, uh, it's a ritual. And it's because it uh, works for us, we feel good. Um, so if we do the practices at, a, for example, a certain time of the day, uh, then when we sit down to do the practice, then the mind-body system is ready to go. Mm -hmm. Then uh, it just uh, drops into that. So that aspect 
of ritual, uh, I think is a very good thing to do. Mm -hmm. And it's very much in line with uh, the other types of things that we do in life. Okay, yeah. so... Uh, move on? Yeah, I, no, I that's okay. I just to yeah. kind of piggyback on your point. <laughs> because I think uh, many people, when they're looking to yoga, they're looking for that centering part. And then, as I think especially in the West, maybe people are not so aware of that stripping away part. And that stripping away part is often very disconcerting and actually very uncomfortable. And I think uh, that's something that we in the yoga world maybe can do a better job of helping people to prepare for that uh, many of the benefits of yoga come through this stripping away and that it's actually uh, some of the centering that we're looking for might be impossible without that stripping away that um, I, I s we see it happen in the yoga class all the time, and you were talking about it. People come in and they're like, well, I'm going to be the best here. <laughs> right? I'm going to beat everyone at yoga. right?" And so without stripping away that preconception of what the person's relationship to yoga is going to be, the person is not going to have that centering experience. And so there are all these preconceptions that we bring to the our yoga practice that if we don't let ourselves be available to losing them, we, we won't get the benefit. Mm. And I, yeah. I agree with you so mm. much. Yeah. And I, I think, um, like you said, this message doesn't really come across much. Mm. When we talk about yoga, even here, we talk about the beneficial parts of yoga. And people come to yoga with the expectation that, okay, I'll be happy, I'll be centered, I'll be, you know, everything will go so much better. And then what they experience is that, wow, this is painful, you know, my emotions come up and it's like mm. a lot of happening in my mind and actually this wasn't, wasn't what I expected at all. So I think this part of yoga, the process that you go through that is essentially essential for the benefit to be experienced. I think that th that's not really uh, communicated well. And I think that's an, a really important part of it. <laughs> okay, uh, so as I said earlier, Fari has been attending a course on uh, mantra meditation. Uh, and I'm just, just wondering if this is something that you can research um, as a biologist. Is this going to be your next research project? Is there something that happens when you say "oom" um, and it kind of vibrates and into your genes or <laughs> something <laughs> like that? <laughs> well, we'll have to do the research and see. Yeah. <laughs> but certainly um, there is, uh, as Howard also mentioned, very uh, good research on uh, meditation and mantra meditation as well. Yeah. Um, well, we know that uh, in when you chant "om," which takes a very short period of time, it probably by itself does not affect our gene expression because the time frame is not correct from a biological perspective. But uh, those uh, uh, practices are linked to each other. So you don't only chant OM, but uh, there is something else associated with it. Uh, as we tried to, um, I think, point out in different ways, Yoga I is not just some physical exercise, it's not just meditation, it's not just breathing, it's really a way of life. Yeah. I think that uh, um, uh, description we, we need to have uh, in our uh, minds. Mm -hmm. So this is why I shared my experience that mm -hmm. I've been practicing this for such a long time, mm -hmm. relatively speaking you know, 30 plus years, but it's fresh each time I go into it. So it's, it's really beautiful in that way. Uh, so yoga, uh, it's difficult to define, in fact. Mm. So, but uh, mantra meditation uh, or any aspect of uh, yogic practice, I think we can uh, study properly as long as it's um, uh, standard or standardized, reproducible from person to person. Mm uh delivered in a similar way so mm. yes and, and of course uh you know some about the um, you know a lot about the meaning of i mean some mantras do have a meaning like literal meaning and other mantras don't they are more like just a sound that is maybe calming or does it matter if you understand the meaning or not or is it does it have an effect anyway 
Well, it has an effect anyway. You know, the you have these two aspects of the language. I mean, this is a huge topic in itself, Sanskrit and the the mantras of the, you know, the sounds in Sanskrit language, uh, because every sound is called a mantra, really, and uh, how you use them. And uh, some mantras, like you say, they are more like have an energetic effect, but um, also the definition of doing japa or mantra meditation, that is, uh, from Yoga Sutra, is repeat it and contemplate upon its meaning. Mm. So you will have an effect by the repetition, mm. but an additional effect if you contemplate yeah. or yeah. understand what it's what it's yes. about. Yeah. Sure. Um, sure. Yes. Or you can also say it uh, the other way around. I agree with what you say, but you can also put it the other way around and say that, yes, you have something if you repeat something and contemplate the meaning, but you have an additional effect from having something repeated which has a sound effect on your body and does not have a meaning. That mm. also s gets going. That's th there have also been done some research mm. on that, mm. that it gets some parts of the brain going that are not linked to sort of the semantic understanding of things. So there are slightly different things happening then. So when you have sounds that are uh, have meaning, that's one type of process. When you have sounds that don't have any meaning but work in by virtue of their sound effect on the body, mm. then that's something different. Yeah. And again, um, sorry, but uh, yeah, there are different traditions. So this means it's not like the one way or the other, but uh, or one thing is right, the other thing is wrong, but you can practice in different ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I, I agree with mm. you as of well. <laughs> there's been lot of lots of different uh, research, biological and other research, on both yoga and meditation mm. Uh, mm. these last uh, few decades. And uh, some of the, that spills over into popular imaginations mm. also, so that mm. I, I taught uh, sort of sound-based meditation to a person in Taiwan who then goes on saying then, and then I felt I got into that alpha state, which <laughs> is sort of when he gets the alpha, mm. alpha wave on the EEG, which of course is nothing that you can sort of say that now <laughs> I am in the alpha state, but that's, he had uh, identified very clearly for yes. himself that's the alpha state, wow. mm. yes. then the alpha waves it's come. It's good to define things, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so I want to ask uh, a question, and it's for all of you. Uh, we have been through some of the areas that have been researched. So what are the blank areas? What, would you, what do you see for the future of yoga research, and what should be researched, and what do you think science might find? <laughs> and then I mean science in like all science, like humanities and social sciences, and like represented a little bit by you. <laughs> Yeah. Can I start? Yes. Um, yes. I think there are lots of open fields. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, a new journal has just uh, been launched, a scientific journal con called Yoga and Race. And uh, the reason for that is that there's a lot of you know, gender and race questions in the imagination of y how yoga is and should mm. be taught. And very often you'd have you know, the, the male expert talking to a 90% female audience. Mm. Why is that? Uh, so there are lots of questions uh, within that. Um, another thing that I find very interesting, and which I think there's too little research on as yet, is uh, how sources of authority change, how it, something that used to be legitimated as a mode of uh, seeking God now has to be legitimated by all sorts of scientific experiments, which can only say something about the effects it has on your body and maybe on how you produce something, mm. but it can't really say anything about the spiritual dimension. Mm. So, it, it th and that does something to the way in which we think about mm. yoga, I think. Mm. Uh, so it would be interesting to see what, how does yoga get authority, in which kinds of periods and where, and, mm. and who yeah. helps giving, you know, making mm. these claims. Yes, mm. okay. And? I think I can talk about th this topic for the next hour or so, because <laughs> there's so much. Uh, but uh, a very interesting question regarding gender is, uh, we can look here and uh, the n what, 80, 90 percent are uh, females. We still don't know why that is, uh, for example, it's an interesting question. Um, but uh, I think one general area 
is the, there's a big body of psychological research and the relatively big body of physiological research on yoga. But they are not done at the same time. Uh, for example, we'd very much like to do our gene expression studies at the same time as fMRI studies, functional uh, MRI studies, looking at what happens in specific regions of the brain, and link it to uh, personal traits, psychological um, experiences. Uh, so mm -hmm. I see that this is a very important uh, area that is, uh, that is lacking. Another very important uh, area is comparative studies between different yoga lineages. We've heard very beautifully uh, the importance of the old, the new, the mixture, the different styles. So which one is best for you? Which one has uh, what effect? We really don't know that at present. There are very few uh, comparative studies. So I think this is going to be a very important uh, area. And that would be from physiological perspective, from psychological perspective, from sociological perspective uh, as well. And then uh, one area uh, as well would be for the effects of yoga for uh, special target groups. For example, uh, drug users, uh, uh, prisoners, uh, there are, there are very uh, interesting uh, programs ongoing in these um, uh, groups. Children, yeah. the, uh, longitudinal studies. What happens if you start your children when they are small? What kind of traits they grow up with? Uh, so really, it's uh, just like yoga itself. Yoga research is endless, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, um, we have to wrap up soon and um, give the word to the audience. But first, I want to take um, a question from one Facebook user. She posted a question on the wall. Um, she is asking, I have read in the book Science of Breath by Swami Rama that you can classify different mental problems by observing the breath pattern, that anxiety is connected to chronic shallow breath and depression to irregular breath. Is there any scientific evidence supporting this? And could this be used as a diagnostic tool? That was by Hilvi Herestad. And then also Sörbe is asking as a follow-up, can we then in turn treat these issues by reversing these patterns? So anybody feel the responsibility to answer this? <laughs> <laughs> I, yes. I may comment on this. Uh, there is a um, couple of very good st studies showing that different uh, breathing patterns are associated with uh, different feelings. So what th these researchers have done uh, from Europe is that uh, mm, they have shown the subjects uh, mm, pictures which will induce different emotions and then uh, measured how they are breathing and different subjects. And they found that uh, there is a correlation between the picture and therefore the emotion that's uh, induced and how they breathe. And then they took uh, the same subjects uh, and they did another experiment. They made the subjects breathe in a certain pattern and then asked them how they felt. And again, there was a correlation between different subjects that different breathing patterns correlated with different emotions. So therefore, uh, it is very much in line with uh, mm. what is said uh, uh, here, but uh, I think uh, we still need to learn more uh, yeah. to go so far as to use specific breathing exercise for this mm. or that. Uh, I would okay. say that there would be a, a package of exercises mm. you would uh, recommend mm. to somebody with anxiety yeah. or depression rather than one specific one. I, I yes, thank you. Possible that I can, uh um, first, I have to say one okay. thing because Halvor is teaching in like oh, okay. ten minutes, mm -hmm. so um, I think we have to open for questions and then mm -hmm. maybe get back to your comment later. Okay, sure. And if there are any, okay, so yes. if there are any questions that you would like to direct to Halvor, <laughs> we will take them first, <laughs> and then we will take the ones that are like for anybody, and then we get back to yeah. Any questions, please? Okay, we have one over there. Wait, 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 you will have a microphone. Okay. <laughs> My name is Gunnar Hassler. I'm a medical doctor. Um, I wonder, 
can yoga replace medicines? I mean, do you have hardcore Cochrane reviewed evidence that, for instance, hypertension can be treated with yoga instead of medicines? Or other musculoskeletal diseases or psychiatric? I mean, there are a lot of so called stress related dis diseases that can be treated with yoga instead of medicines. I think, uh, to the extent that I'm the right person to answer <laughs> this question, I think. Uh, the yes, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, he'll come, come to me. To the extent that uh, th there is, to some extent, uh, the case that for some people, they may feel that after yoga, after meditation, they may not need their medicine anymore. But what one should always say in such cases is not without consulting your doctor, not without consulting you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but I, w I ask if there is, is some evidence, really hardcore evidence, that this will work. There is uh, some evidence regarding uh, blood pressure and meditation, for instance. Uh, but uh, the, the evidence is, of, uh, is not such that you would, by on the basis of that, uh, just replace ordinary hypertension treatment with meditation unless you see that it actually has worked. Mm -hmm. Fari, would you like to comment on uh, this? Sure. So, um, as Halvor said, uh, the evidence so far would suggest that um, uh, yogic practice could be very beneficial uh, uh, auxiliary uh, treatment. Uh, but uh, there are reports showing that people would use less medication for example, in hypertension, because uh, uh, we know something about uh, the uh, mechanisms as well. For example, the hypothalamic uh, pituitary adrenal axis is um, uh, its overactivity is um, downregulated through yogic practice, and that would have uh, beneficial effects. Uh, so, uh, definitely, not yogic practice would not be considered replacement for therapy but uh, as, a, as an adjunct to uh, current uh, treatments. There have been some studies uh, comparing medication head-to-head -head with uh, yogic practice, and, uh, but more needs to be done in uh, different uh, conditions. For example, in uh, clinical depression, uh, comparing uh, uh, electroshock therapy and some of the drugs like imipramine with uh, yogic practice, and there are uh, comparable effects, but more studies need to be done before mm. we can make statements. Great, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for this very interesting question. And um, do we have other questions? I think I'll just sort of go to my students who yeah. are <laughs> waiting. <laughs> okay. Uh, and who will hear about, or we will discuss with them Chinese uh, traditions of self-cultivation, so it's okay. always relevant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Albert. <laughs> okay, we still have some nice people left. Uh, do we have any questions? Don't be shy. Okay, there, a question over there. Uh, you were talking about the how yoga also can um, release stuff from you and that that is not a comfortable <laughs> maybe not always comfortable. How do you address this or uh, how is it best like a follow up if you start a process when you start to let go of things and it's like a hard process? Do you continue doing yoga or how do you, like what kind of advice would you give <laughs> when you go into this process? Yeah, um, I, I think that it's uh, one of the crucial initial practices of yoga that is, I think, traditional, which I think we neglect in our current times, is uh, in Buddhism, they call it going for refuge. Um, what a scholar, Alexander Brzezin, calls it uh, safe direction. And so what I'm saying is that as an initial practice, to be able to learn how to feel safe, to learn to be able to recognize feelings of safety within yourself, I think that's a great initial practice that you might be able to use breathing techniques, you might be able to use yoga asana to help you feel grounded, connected into your body and to be able to feel safe. And from that place of feeling safety, then you can go out to 
explore these ideas of stripping things away. But if you just start stripping things away without knowing how to feel safe, you're going to feel like you're being destroyed in the process. You're going to feel like the process of stripping away is killing you. Mm. Um, because it is. I mean, it's killing who you think you are. <laughs> so if you don't feel that there's some that you're going to make it through that process, that you feel safe to make it through that process, then it's better to, to slow down. Like uh, there was a, a slide, I, I'm going to do this like faster and, you know, mm -hmm. sl let's slow down. <laughs> you know, that in, that's very much around, uh, that's where having these uh, vacations, these places where you go away, where you find a community, you don't necessarily have to go away to do that, but somehow finding a community where you do feel safe people that you feel safe with, then it becomes safer to, to do that stripping away. And without that, I think, pause on the stripping away. Yeah. Because in my experience, for both me and uh, the people I meet, we all have a lot of things that we need to, to go through yeah. to, to find this, this still place. Yeah, so yeah. it's uh, really not uh, easy terrain. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you. Did uh, Katinka wants to add something? Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to follow up on you, mm. and I think it's really important what you say, that you take things easy. Uh, I, I for people who, you know, attend something once a week, that's fine, and once a day, that's fine. But once you start going into these oasis practices, uh, and you think, okay, yoga and meditation is all I'm going to do for this one week or ten days or whatever it is, then you're going to meet people who have done it for 20, 40 years, who already are in the position that they can have practice for five or six hours every day without any problem. Don't try to imitate that, is, is my advice. Uh, do it little by little, step by step. Take your first baby steps, and if you feel uncomfortable, mm -hmm. just you know, pause, withdraw, and mm -hmm. then go back in when you're ready. That's really, really mm -hmm. an important advice, because, um, yeah, you open up, you, you can open a floodgate of, um, mm -hmm. of unexpected uh, feelings and emotions mm -hmm. that are not necessarily good for you if you mm -hmm. don't do it carefully. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. and then Fari, if you can be very short. Yes, so yeah. the, this is uh, actually brings up, a, I think, a very important point, and that is practice of yoga, you cannot just look at a YouTube video and do it by yourself. You need to practice with an instructor mm -hmm. and then follow through with an instructor in a lineage, then you will be taken care of because mm. the instructors know exactly what may happen and what to do when something happens. Mm. So just a reminder. Yeah. Yeah, still <laughs> <many people. laughs> okay, we have time for one more question. One more question, anybody? So I'm an example of a woman, 62 years old. Uh, tr about three years ago, I had an accident who stroked my uh, right shoulder. So on MR, uh, it was an evidence of a rupture on the rotator cuff muscles. Luckily for me, uh, I had been practicing yoga for a period of time, actually, maybe like 20 years. And so when the doctor said that uh, the only the thing they could uh, offer was an operation with uh, maybe less than 25% of success, I decided to just go for it. So today, my last MR shows, yes, there has been a rupture, uh, no, uh, there is no miscirculation, or how to put it. The circulation in the area is good. I don't any longer have uh, pain in my shoulder during the night. I picked up other interests that I have in life, like dancing. So, you know, in dancing, you rotate a lot, and, and the shoulders are, their flexibility is a part of that. Mm. So I think that to the panel, uh, when we, we turn in talking too much about the mental aspects of yoga, uh, I would like to sort of give my example that there are other aspects as well mm. that can be very health gaining. Mm. 
Thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you for this question. Um, yes, who would like to answer? We have to be a little bit short because we are behind schedule. I, I didn't understand the question well enough. So, to answer. Yeah, the question. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, okay. So, can I turn it a little bit? Is yoga essentially different from other kind of movements, other such as dance and other related things that involve your your whole body that are uh, systemic? S yeah. Certainly, moving one's body is a useful thing to do in life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, that's great, you yeah. know, and that will give you mm. all sorts of benefits yeah. in life. Um, so yeah. then I think there is something different about yoga, which is where we are connecting, where we are connecting all these different aspects of ourselves, mm. our breath, our emotions, mm. our thought, into an integrated practice. Yeah. So if, if I were going to say what is yoga, that it would be the practice where you bring all those together. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the ones who had questions. Thank you for sharing your experience. And thank you so much to the panel. Um, now we're going to have a little change of scenery. You can take f four minutes break uh, while we do that. And then it's all about yoga and with live music. And I hope you will enjoy. But thank you to the panel. <laughs> So this is John Benson here, going to lead a yoga session. And it's accompanied by live music by and with Paul Stefan Brekke. Yeah. Yes. And um, Per Christian Berg. So what was the name of your band again? Ganymedia. Ganymedia. That's the, this yoga band. OK, so enjoy. Okay. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Before we start to move our bodies, I'll just say uh, a few things. One is that if we can connect our breath to our movements, we start to have a different experience of the yoga. And so for this, we're going to do a special kind of breath where we breathe in long through the nose and then out long through the nose. And we see if we can keep that going for the whole session with a gentle smile on your face you will forget and that's okay. You'll just, just breathe, okay? Breathe, don't hold your breath. Um, but if you can do that long breath in and that long breath out, it can help to give you a nice experience. Nothing here should hurt, so if you find that you are in pain, it is okay to just stop, okay? Um, and then that being said, we're going to also just pay attention to how we're feeling, and how we're treating ourselves throughout this practice. And that if you notice that you're not treating yourself so kindly, it's okay to just stop, okay? And just take a moment and just check in with yourself, okay? And I don't, if you lay down in the middle, that's fine, everything is fine, okay? All right. <laughs> so find a comfortable seat. Lifting your spine up nice and tall. You can allow your eyes to close and bring your attention to your breath without controlling your breath. next inhalation, you can gently allow your eyes to open. And then on your next inhalation, you can allow your arms to rise up to the side in cactus arms. And then exhaling, gently rotating to your right. Inhaling, coming back to center. Exhaling, gently rotating to your left. Inhaling to center. Exhale right. Inhale to center. Exhale left. Inhaling to center, pause here. Exhale, releasing your arms down. And then let's make our way up to stand. 
If you have a mat, we'll come toward the front of the mat, separating your feet out nice and wide, lifting up the toes, spreading the toes. And you might notice the arches of your feet might lift up. And see if you can keep that lift of your arch and then lay the toes back down. Bending the knees slightly, sending your seat back, touching the fingertips together, inhaling, raising the arms up. Pause here and breathe. Exhaling, lowering the arms and coming back up to stand. Allow your eyes to close and just bring your attention inward to the sensations in your body. Noticing your breath. On your next inhalation, touching your fingertips, hips back, chest forward, raising the arms up. And then exhaling, extending your left leg behind you, opening your heart, lifting your chest up. And then exhaling, bringing your left foot forward again, back to the front, raising your arms up. And exhaling, releasing the arms to the side. Inhaling, hips back, chest forward, raising the arms. Exhaling, right leg back, extending the right leg behind you, lifting your chest. And then on your next inhalation, bringing the right leg forward, raising the arms up. Exhaling, releasing the arms to the side, coming to stand, pausing here, bringing your attention inward, allowing yourself to notice. On your next inhalation, folding forward, hips back, chest forward. Exhale, left leg back. Inhaling, lowering the left foot down behind you so that you're in a high lunge. And then we'll exhale, sink down a little bit lower by wiggling that back foot a little bit further back. Inhaling, taking your arms up to cactus arms. And exhaling, turning to your right. Inhaling, coming back to center. Exhale, lower the arms down. Inhale, reach up. Exhale, swing the arms back, raise your left leg up. And then inhale, bring the left foot forward, coming back to that forward fold. Exhale, straight legs, arms to the side. Inhale, hips back, chest forward. Exhaling, right leg back. Inhaling, lowering the right foot down behind you. Keeping the heel up. Exhale, wiggle that foot back, lower you down a little bit more. Inhale to cactus arms. Exhale, turn to your left. Inhaling to center. Exhale, lower the arms. Inhale, rise up, reach up. Exhale, sweep the arms back, raise your right leg up. Inhale, bringing the right foot forward, coming to the forward fold. Exhale, straight legs, arms to the side, and pause here. Close your eyes, bring your attention inward. We're going to take this sequence that we've just done and we'll make a little ritual of it. We're gonna repeat it a few times. At some point, I will stop talking and we will continue to move. When I stop talking, that gives us a chance to drop deeply into our own experience of this and to be present to what's going on with us. Standing up nice and tall. On your next inhalation, forward fold. Exhale, left leg back. Inhaling, lowering the left foot down behind you. Exhale, wiggle that back foot, lower down some more. Inhale to cactus arms. Exhale, turn to your right. Inhale to center. Exhale, lower. Inhale, reach up. 
exhale, fly. Inhale, left leg comes forward. Exhale, straight legs, arms to the side. Inhale, forward fold. Exhale, right leg back. Inhaling, lowering the right foot down. Exhale, lowering the hips. Inhale, arms up to cactus arms. Exhale, turn to your left. Inhale, center. Exhale, lower. Inhale, reach up. Exhale, fly. Inhale, forward fold. Exhale, Tadasana. Inhale, forward fold. Exhale, left leg back. Inhale, lowering the left. Exhale, sink down. Inhale, arms up. Exhale, turn to your right. Inhale, center. Exhale, lower. Inhale, reach. Exhale, fly. Inhale, forward fold. Exhale, Tadasana. Inhale. Exhale, right leg back. Inhale, lowering the right. Exhale, sink. Inhale, arms up. Exhale, turn to your left. Inhale, center. Exhale, lower. Inhale, reach. Exhale, fly. I'm going to say less and less. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale, left leg back. of your mat, pause here, allow your eyes to close, bring your attention inward, and notice. Next inhalation, gently allowing your eyes to open, exhaling fully, inhaling forward fold, exhaling left leg back, inhale lower the left foot down, and this time we're going to let the left heel come down. We'll take the arms up and raise them up to the side, spreading the fingers, and just noticing where we are, just using the muscles that you need to be here and seeing if you can relax what doesn't need to be used to keep you here. On your next exhalation, lowering the arms, inhaling, reaching forward, bringing the palms together, 
leaning onto your right foot, lifting the left foot off the ground, opening the left arm up, bringing your left foot behind you. Palms to your heart. Inhaling, reach up. Exhale, arms down. Palms are facing up. Rolling the shoulders open. Keep the shoulders rolled open. Turn the palms down. Gaze over your right fingertips. Allow your gaze to soften. On your next inhalation, straightening out your right leg. Exhaling, bring the left foot a little bit closer. Inhaling, reaching out to your right. On your next inhalation, rising up, touching the thumbs to the shoulders, exhaling. Inhaling, lifting the heart, and then exhaling, shifting your weight to your right leg, lifting the left leg off the ground, and see if you can raise that left leg up, <clears throat> gazing at a single point. On your next inhalation, lowering the left foot back down again. Exhale, lower the arms. Inhale, reach forward. And then exhale, step up to the front of the mat. Pause here, close your eyes. And here you might notice a difference between what's going on on the left side of your body and what's going on on the right side of your body and just allow yourself to be present to that. Allowing your eyes to open on your next inhalation, coming to a forward fold. Exhale, right leg back. Inhaling, lowering the right foot down, bringing the heel down. Right hip comes forward. Inhale, reaching up, spreading your fingers. See if you can relax your face, relax your forehead. You probably don't need to tighten up your face to keep you here. Exhaling, lowering the arms. Inhaling, reaching forward, taking the weight into the left leg, right foot starts peeling off the ground. Inhaling, opening up, and then exhale, lowering your foot down. Palms to the chest. On the next inhalation, raising the arms up. Exhaling, arms come down. Keeping the shoulders rolled open, you can bring the palms down, gazing over the left fingertips. allowing your soft gaze to look past your left fingertips. On your next inhalation, straightening out the left leg, exhaling, right foot comes a little bit closer, shortening your stance, inhaling, reaching out to the left, Allow yourself to pause here and breathe. Inhaling, rising up. Exhaling, thumbs to the shoulders. Inhale here, and then exhale, shift your weight to your left, raising your right leg up.
your next inhalation, lowering the right foot down. Exhale, lower your arms. Inhaling, reaching forward. Exhaling, stepping up to the front. Pausing, allow your eyes to close. Bring your attention inward. Allowing your eyes to open. Inhaling, forward fold. Exhale, left leg back. Inhaling, lowering the left foot down, keeping the heel up this time, and then you can wiggle that foot back. We're going to bring the right knee behind the right ankle, either on top of or behind the right ankle. We'll inhale, turn the palms up, draw the elbows in, and we'll just stay here and breathe for a moment. On your next exhalation, we're going to experiment with what happens if we move toward the floor. No need to touch the floor. We're just going to move our hands toward the floor as we exhale. And then as we inhale, we'll take, turn the palms up, draw the elbows in, lifting the heart. Exhale, bring the hands lower or not. And then inhale, raising up. And then exhaling. For some of us, the hands will come down to the ground. For some, it won't. If the hands are coming down to the ground and you can relax your face, then that's okay to rest your hands there. But if you find your face is getting all twisted or you feel like this is some kind of cruel torture, then you can come back up. If you're here comfortably with a gentle expression on your face, you can wiggle the left foot a little bit further back. Inhale, lift your heart and pause here, allowing yourself to be present to the sensations in your own body, allowing yourself to notice your breath, and you might even have some emotions coming up now, so allow yourself to be present to that as well. Next exhalation, slowly, gently lowering your left knee down, bringing your right leg back, bringing your seat back to your heels, and then you can rest your head down into a bed on your hands and pause. Rising up, breathing freely, making your way back up to stand, coming back up to the front of your mat, closing your eyes again, bringing your attention inward. On your next inhalation, coming to a forward fold. Exhaling, right leg back. Inhaling, lowering that right foot down. Exhale, wiggle it back a little bit further. On your next inhalation, taking the palms up, elbows in. Stay here and breathe, pausing. exhalation you can begin to move your hands toward the ground it's okay if you don't get anywhere close to the ground it's no yogi cookies for who touches the ground inhale rise up exhale inhale rise and then some of you will be able to touch the ground and you'll be comfortable there 
if you are, then you can stay. And if you're not, give yourself permission to come out, giving yourself permission to rest. On your next exhalation, lowering your right knee down very gently, bringing your left foot back, bringing your seat back to your heels. You can make a pillow with your hands, resting your head down. rising up, breathing freely, making your way up to stand. We're going to do one more standing pose. This is uh, not a super difficult pose, but it's almost impossible, okay? Separating your feet out nice and wide. <laughs> So it's okay, you can just stagger forward and back. You don't really need a mat for this. And then we're just gonna bend our knees, bringing the butt back. Palms up, elbows drawing back. And then just noticing your breath, allow yourself to stay here. If this starts to feel really unpleasant, you can bring some movement into it can start to shift to your right, maybe raise up a little bit and then shift to your left and down. So down and right and up. You might even let your arms participate in that as you inhale, reaching up, and as you exhale, coming down and over. allow ourselves to change direction going left and up and right and down. Giving yourself permission to pause at any time. There's no extra bonus to continuing when you feel like resting. The rest of your life is like that. Right? Your yoga practice, you can have a break. Yeah. <laughs> Coming to rest in the center. Pause. Inhaling, extending your legs, breathing freely, toes in, heels, toes. Coming up to stand, allowing your eyes to close bringing your attention to your breath. You can turn to face front separating your feet out nice and wide, bending your knees slightly, reaching back with your chest and forward with your heart, bowing forward, knees slightly bent, and then seeing if you can put your weight into your heels and reaching forward, allowing your back to round here so that you can feel some release through your back as you reach forward.
rocking gently forward. Resting down onto your knees. Making a pillow with your hands. Inhaling, rising up. Taking your hands behind you so that you can release your legs out to the front. Bringing your seat to the center of your mat. Catching the fronts of your shins, checking behind you that if you roll back, there's nothing back there that you're gonna crack your head on. And very slowly allow yourself to roll back hugging the knees in, rocking gently, extending your left leg out straight onto the mat, rolling onto the left side of your body, cradling your neck with your right hand, allowing yourself to open up into a twist by allowing the right elbow to open up to the right side and softening here. Inhaling here, exhaling, closing the twist by bringing the right elbow across your body. Inhaling onto your back, hugging the knees in, rocking gently from side to side. Extending your right leg out straight onto the mat. Rolling onto the right side of your body. Cradling your neck with your left hand gently turning open to your left. Inhaling here, exhale, closing your twist by bringing your left elbow across your body. Inhaling onto your back, rocking gently. Extending your left leg out straight onto the mat. Extending your right leg out straight onto the mat. Laying your arms alongside the body. Rolling your shoulder blades underneath you allowing your eyes to close, releasing control of your breath, allowing yourself to soften in and be present.
breath to deepen, gently wiggling your fingers and toes, rotating your wrists and ankles. With great care, you can extend your arms out over your head, stretching from the tips of your fingers to the tips of your toes in a delicious all-body stretch. With great care, drawing one leg and then the other leg into your chest, embracing both legs with your arms, rocking slowly from side to side, coming to rest on the right side of your body, using your right arm as a pillow for your head. Using your hands and elbows, making your way up to a comfortable seat. We're gonna finish with a special kind of ohm. It has three parts. This ohm has an ah, an o, oh, and a mm. Okay, so uh, we'll do ah, and then that will turn into o, oh, and then we'll end with a mm. And just let yourself uh, be free, okay? Yeah? Nobody knows that it's you that's oming out of key, okay? Inhaling fully. Uh. Thank you all so much for playing yoga with me this afternoon. I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day, and I hope that uh, you continue your exploration of yoga. There's so much to it. And uh, yeah, so thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, John. Oh. Mm. And thank you to Gandhi Media. Okay, so um, thank you all for coming today and for following the stream. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, and I have a little favor to ask from you. Uh, this is a library, so please be a little bit quiet until you're outside. So yeah, so all the, all the chatting can wait until you're just outside the door. Or you can hang around here a little bit, of course. That's, that's also fine. So, but just when you go out through the library, just keep it low. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.